Hey, this is Pastor Drew Page, and I'm coming to you today to bring Worship from the Word, lesson number six on issues in worship ministry. So what are some issues that we face in the worship ministry that are somewhat particular to our area um, of service for the kingdom? We're going to be talking about um, some things like what often arises most uh, in worship ministry issues. What are some things that, that worship uh, ministers, pastors, uh, helpers, what do we deal with often that, uh, that constitutes a worship ministry issue? Another thing we'll look at is what instructions Paul gives the church um, as an antidote uh, to worship ministry issues. And then we're also going to talk about what we can learn from the apostles' teaching on spiritual gifts to talk about how we can use our gifts properly so that we can limit some of the worship ministry issues that we face. And uh, we're also going to talk about how we today should address these issues and how we should uh, confront them, how we should overcome them, and uh, ultimately lead everything back to the glory of God. Um, so, before I dive into this lesson, I invite you to hit the subscribe button and, and ring the bell, uh, hit that little bell button so that you can get uh, notifications uh, on when these videos are uploaded. This is going to be the last in the six-part series that we've been doing, uh, particularly for our church at Cortland Baptist, where uh, in order to participate on the stage in the worship ministry, you have to go through these six classes. And the reason we're doing that is because we find that in most circumstances, worship conflict often comes more from the heart than from the sound. And so if we can fix the heart issues and we can understand what God's Word says about worship ministry, we can cut down on a lot of the drama, a lot of the hurt feelings, uh, a lot of the selfishness and pride that comes along with uh, being on the stage leading in worship. So we're making this a mandatory training. Now, there will still be Bible studies in regard to worship coming uh, going forward. Uh, we are going to next look at a survey of worship in the Bible. So we're going to start from Genesis 1 and work our way through and see what uh, passages address the issue of worship. So I'm not going to go in extreme detail as we hit each one, but basically give you some guideposts so that you can do your own individual in-depth study of these texts from part of this biblical survey of worship. And I think it'll be beneficial for you. Maybe you can add this as part of your devotional life. Uh, now that many of us have been relegated to home or limited in our work time that we can go to work, uh, we have more time to make sure that we understand God's Word and follow His teaching. So stay tuned. We'll keep having these worship Bible studies, and I think that they'll be a blessing to you. The first worship issue we see is pride over who baptized who. We see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 14 through 15. Paul is addressing the church of Corinth, who has, it seems, turned to a, a fractured church, They've picked who they like to follow. They, they take pride in who led them to Christ or who baptized them. In verses 14 through 15, it says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. So the people in the church were saying, I am of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas or Peter, and I'm of Christ. And so they were all bragging about who baptized who. And we're trying to build some sort of power structure about their um, spiritual development of who led them to the Lord. And Paul is saying, that's ridiculous. Everyone is baptized into the name of Christ. It's not about who baptized whom. It's about who saved you. But this was an issue in worship in the church of Corinth. Another worship issue that we see is abuse of the Lord's table. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty, it says, when you come together... It is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. What happened was, is those who were wealthy came and they ate all the food. And the people who were of lower estate economically in that time were refused the ability to eat. And so some people weren't able to participate 
because others were taking advantage of them. They were abusing the Lord's table. They were abusing a very symbol of what our salvation story entails. And therefore, they were breaking fellowship because they were putting themselves and, and their rights over the rights of other people. And that was an issue that Paul wanted to address in the early church. Another issue of, of worship ministry in the early church was misuse of spiritual gifts. The Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit gives to each individual Christian spiritual gifts of some sort, but they're to be used for the building up of the body. And in 1 Corinthians 14, 9, the Apostle Paul says, So with yourselves, if with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? So there was a big premium on speaking in tongues in the early church because it was an outward manifestation that seemed to give some sort of proof of power. And so they would uh, try to speak in tongues, and it would be nothing that would be intelligible that people could understand. And in fact, there were some who would be speaking in tongues, but there would be no one that could interpret it. And the Apostle Paul says that's not the way spiritual gifts operate. Spiritual gifts are not meant to bring yourself pride, to bring yourself satisfaction, to bring yourself a, a sense of, of power and prestige. They're meant to benefit the church. And this misuse of spiritual gifts was something that significantly impacted the early church at Corinth. Lastly, a misuse of worship was a disregard for God's word and the preaching of the gospel message. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, 1, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you. See, they were putting all their little demonstrations ahead of teaching and preaching the Word of God. And what a scary thing it is to relegate the Word of God to something less than music or prophecy or healing or speaking in tongues. When we give little time to God's Word and we give maximum time to the things that we enjoy and that make us feel good about ourselves, we are misusing worship. That is a worship issue. So what instructions does Paul give the church as an antidote to issues in worship ministry? Well, he says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31 through 11, 1, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. So let's look at some of these phrases on instructions that Paul gives the early church that we can use to look at to say, how do we fix these worship ministry issues? So he gives three things. First, do all to the glory of God. If we're doing everything for God's glory, we save no glory for ourselves. We save no glory for our friends and neighbors. It's all for God's glory. He alone is worthy. And so we can fix our ministry issues by focusing on giving glory to God in everything that we do, whether we're singing, preaching, praying, seeing, or reading. We do everything for the glory of God. The second antidote that he provides is that the church be unified, that we be unified. Now, that doesn't mean that we unify around our sins. It means we unify around who God is and what the Word of God teaches. It means that we lay aside our personal rights for the benefits of others. It means that our preferences about music, about worship styles, about liturgy, we set them aside for the benefit of the body, whatever the body needs. If the body needs to be more of a contemporary style worship, then we defer to the body to do that. If the body is more benefited by a more traditional style, then if we're contemporary people that enjoy that style of worship, we may need to lay down our rights for the betterment of the whole body. Or if we need to do some sort of blend that helps us figure out a brand new voice for the congregation, 
we all may need to lay down our rights for the betterment of the entire body so that we may grow together in unity. The third antidote is that we imitate him, talking about the Apostle Paul, as he seeks to imitate Christ. So we first and foremost should make sure that we're imitating Christ. Christ is the ultimate example. He is the ultimate example of someone who laid down his rights so that we could be lifted up, so that we could have a relationship with God the Father. Were it not for Christ's willingness to come and lay down his life for us, we would have no hope of eternal life. Instead, we would all be bound for a devil's hell. But because Christ was willing to lay down his rights and surrender his very life so that we could be saved, so likewise, Paul is calling the church of Corinth and he's calling us today to be willing to lay down our rights, what we may be entitled to, what may make us feel uh, more excited about worship and more uplifted personally for the betterment of the entire body. That's what Christians are called to do as an antidote to these worship ministry issues is lay down our rights for others. So what principles can be discerned from Paul's teaching on the use of spiritual gifts? What can we learn about his instructions about using them, about how uh, they should serve the greater body of the church? What can we learn about Paul's teaching and spiritual gifts that we can apply to the worship ministry? Number one, we see a principle of edification. A principle of edification. 1 Corinthians 14 3 through 4 and verse 26 read as follows. The one who prophesies speaks to people for uh, their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. What then, brothers? When you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. So this principle of edification reigns true with three additional sub-principles. Number one, love builds up. Love does not break down. Love does not destroy. Love builds up. We hear people all the time say, oh, I love you, brother. Oh, I love you, sister. But what steps are we taking to show that love by building them up? When we say, oh, I got a complaint, oh, I got a problem, oh, we got an issue, unless we're doing it to build the person up, we probably shouldn't be speaking in that way. Everything that we say should be said for the upbuilding of the church. And complaining and groaning and moaning isn't going to upbuild the church. Now, there are biblical ways of bringing up concerns that are legitimate, that if heeded will build up the church, those need to be presented, but they also need to be presented with love for others, not love for self. Another principle we see out of this principle of edification is that love never ends. This love should be a continual love, a love that derives from the Spirit of Christ. It's mentioned in Galatians as one of the fruits of the Spirit, of love. And, and if it comes from an eternal God, it's a love that should also likewise be eternal. Now, clearly, we're finite beings. We're sinful human beings. We cannot ever have perfect love. But we should strive for that love, and we should ask the Holy Spirit to fill us with that love so that we have unending love for our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And then the third principle we would see out of 1 Corinthians 14, 1, which is, that we should pursue love. We need to seek love. We need to ask God to fill us with love, and we need to find ways to show love. We need to pursue it. We need to seek after it so that we can find ways to demonstrate that love to our brothers and sisters in Christ. In 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 through 7, we see Paul's call for use of the church's gifts for the common good. For the common good. It says, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, 
but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Peter's call for stewardship of the church's gifts to serve one another is found in 1 Peter 4, 10 through 11. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So Paul calls us to use church gifts for the common good, and Peter calls us to use the stewardship of the church's gifts to serve one another. So we've seen the principle of edification. Now let's look at the principle of intelligibility. Intelligibility. Now that seems like a, a, a big word, and, and it is, but it's basically the ability to be intelligent, the ability to make things understandable. 1 Corinthians 14, verses 7 through 9 says, If even lifeless instruments, such as the flute or the harp, do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? And if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? So with yourselves, if your tongue, you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into the air. So in other words, Paul is saying, if you're speaking in a way that people can't be built up or learn anything, there's nothing uh, that piques the intellect, nothing that grasps the mind. We're just speaking into the air. We're saying nothing. We have to make sure people can understand what it is that we're trying to say, what that message is. So what are some of the problems with unintelligible speech in corporate worship? Well, in verses 7 through 8, we see a problem when what we sing or say is not clear. That's a problem. We need to make sure there's clarity. Another thing is when something cannot be understood as mentioned in verses 7 and 9. And then another issue is when it does not benefit others, as set out in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 6. So we need to address these problems through the principle of intelligibility. We need to make sure that it's clear. We need to make sure that it's understandable. We need to make sure that it makes people better. So we have the principle of edification, the principle of intelligibility. And now let's look at the principle of order. Order. Ah! All of my contemporary friends are like, no, order. We don't need order. And, and our traditional friends may be like, oh, yes, order. We love it. We love order. So what are we talking about, though, when we say order? What does that mean? Does that mean that we have to have every single little thing planned out? Uh, and if we deviate from the bulletin in any way that the, the whole service is a failure and things have fallen apart? Well, of course not. There's no biblical basis even for a bulletin. A bulletin is something that we created to help make us uh, be able to follow the service in a more manageable way to know what to expect. But at the same time, if the Spirit moves in such a way, we should not be bound and chained to a bulletin. We need to make sure that we have order but that order be free to allow the life of the Spirit to move us in different directions if that's where God leads us to go. So what does the Bible say about the principle of order? In 1 Corinthians 14, verses 30 through 33 and verse 40, it says, If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all be encouraged. And the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. But all things should be done decently and in order. So what was Paul talking about here? So there were many people in the church of Corinth who wanted to share a word. But rather than letting everyone have their turn, they were all trying to do it 
at the same time. And nobody was benefiting because it was all done in a way that pleased them and made them feel important. So they took over the service. And then when the other person said, oh, well, they're taking my turn, they started talking. And then everybody's talking at the same time and there's no order at all. So what is the problem here? The problem is, is that everyone was trying to say something at the same time and no one could benefit from what was being taught. The reasons for orderly worship are first, so all can benefit, as set out in verse 1431. Instead of having everybody go at the same time, they were to prophesy one by one so that all could learn and all could be encouraged. If we had the songs the same time as the preaching, the same time as the praying, the same time as the announcements, nobody would get anything because it would just all be jumbled together. It doesn't make sense to not have some order. There needs to be some order so that all can learn and all can be encouraged. But the second reason for orderly worship comes from verse 33, which says, For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. In other words, the very nature of God is orderly. And because we are image bearers of God, we too are images of his order. We need to have order because it comes from the very nature of who God is. So how do we demonstrate these principles of edification, these principles of intelligibility, and these principles of order? Well, we hearken all the way back to the lesson on the biblical dimensions of worship. We start first with the vertical dimension, the up and down. We make sure that first and foremost, our worship is all done to the glory of God as set out in 1 Corinthians 10, 31. If we get the vertical wrong, we'll get the horizontal wrong and we'll get the outward wrong. We must make sure that everything that we do, whether it's an edification whether it's an intelligibility or whether it is in order that we do everything for God's glory first, not for our preferences and our styles. But then the second thing that we need to consider is the horizontal dimension of worship. When we consider edification, we're talking about building up the horizontal dimension. Those are our brothers and sisters in Christ. Those who are on that same plane with us that we're trying to build them up and encourage them and lift them up. So we need to make sure that horizontal dimension of worship is satisfied as set out in 1 Corinthians 14, 26. Let all things be done for building up. And then the third dimension of worship is the outward dimension, where we're seeking to reach the lost through our worship ministry. Our worship ministry, while it should have that vertical dimension and should have that horizontal dimension, should also have an outward dimension of trying to reach men, women, boys, and girls with the gospel of Jesus Christ. As 1 Corinthians 14.40 says, all things should be done decently and in order. And the reason why it should be done that way is so that if a lost person were to come into the service, they would be able to understand and come to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ in an intelligible way so that they could understand it and hopefully give their heart and life to Jesus Christ. So with that, that concludes our worship from the word, uh, mandatory training for Cortland Baptist Church. And hopefully for those of you who've experienced this, uh, whether at your church or in your own personal uh, worship life, uh, you've been blessed by it. Uh, the next series that I'll be working on uh, is the Survey of Worship in the Bible. And I hope you'll tune in for that starting with videos next week. And uh, I want this to, to help you in this time of worship. Um, I can tell you that during this time of, of isolation and quarantine, that this has been a very difficult time for me. So one of the things that has helped me has been being able to worship God and knowing that when I'm singing to him with the breath that he's given to me, that he can help me through any of this. Worship is such a powerful thing, but it doesn't need to be the self-seeking, self-motivating things that we hear from some songs. They need to be biblically based, biblically principled, and they need to be songs that not only fill us up, but also return worship and glory to God for who he is. 
So if you've missed any of these other Worship from the Word sessions, uh, I'm creating a playlist for you. We'll work on that so that you can go back and listen to these other worship videos and um, hopefully learn from those. If you would like a copy of the Worship from the Word study guide, um, shoot me an email at drew, D-R-E-W, at drewpage, D-R-E-W-P-A-G-E, dot com. And uh, if you'll shoot me that email, I'll be glad to send you a copy of any of the uh, study guides uh, so that you can fill in the blanks along with these videos. And I'll try to prepare some uh, for the upcoming lessons as well. So God bless you and God bless your worship.